Okay guys, welcome to Bricks and Rides again. And he says in his finest YouTube voice that if you are enjoying this video, please like and subscribe because we need the subscribers, because we need the money to build these things. If you don't enjoy this video, please subscribe anyway and be an accomplice to our getting money to build these things video. So today we're going to talk about the Suzu KD 2000. It's a 1984 and we're going to talk about the load sensor valve. But before we talk about that, I think it's very important to understand braking in a vehicle. Um, braking in any vehicle is by no means a static thing. It's very dynamic. It, it changes all the time. If you look at a motorcycle, for example, when you look at a sports bike, its front wheel is actually the front tire looks like it's on backwards and that is because the back wheel is to make it go but the front wheel is to make it stop and you would think this is quite strange because it's got back brakes and it's got front brakes so why is it that way and what happens is when whenever you are moving a vehicle it's got a center of gravity and that center of gravity moves with the vehicle so when you are stopping the entire center of gravity, also known as the weight of the vehicle, moves forward. When you are accelerating, it moves back. So when you accelerate, your weight moves back. You have more pressure on the back wheel and you have more grip on the tire. When you are braking, all the weight moves forward and you have more pressure because you have more weight on the front wheel. And that's why it is predominantly used for braking. So about 80% on a bike, your, your brakes are working in the front. Which is why generally sports bikes, they've got their tyre on backwards because that's when you need the most grip is on your braking. And they also have dual discs in the front and only one disc at the back. Because the back brake is just used to load your weight forward. And the same applies to a vehicle. When you are turning right, all the weight moves to the left. So you have more traction on the left hand tyres and vice versa. And when you are braking, its weight does move forward and, and, and this is where your load sensor valve comes in because in any vehicle you have this dynamic movement of, of, of weight and traction and, and this is the whole relationship that you're working with. Now in a bucky or a pickup for some you have an added variable and that is this load bin on the back which is off at the moment as you can see. Um, we've taken it off to get the chassis 100% Waterproofed, springs done, shocks done, the differential done, and everything is just a lot easier with the load bin off. But we'll get back to that later. Now, what you've got when you've got a bucky, which we call it here in South Africa, also known as a pickup, um, is this huge variable of how much weight you have in the back. And, and this is changing all the time. It's not only changing with your acceleration or deceleration or braking, it's also changed with what you put in the back. Because if this is a one ton bucket, if you put one ton in the back here, some things are gonna happen. And what's the first thing that's gonna happen is you're going to get extra traction on your tires because of the weight. You're also, when you're braking, you're gonna have that movement, that weight shifting to the front. And what can happen is if you have too much pressure in on the front brakes, less pressure on the back brakes, your vehicle can actually go sideways. And when the bucky is empty, or pick up as the Americans like to call it, you have less pressure on the back wheels. So when you are braking again, your your back wheels are more inclined to lock up because, because you have too much brakiness, I like to call it, going to your back wheels and a lot less traction because of a lot less weight. So because of this, this constant variable happening in the back, what most pickups have nowadays, or buckies as we like to call them in South Africa, is a load sensor valve. And this is a very, very simple mechanism. And what it does is as you load it, the back of the bucky goes down, but the axle doesn't because it's fixed to the wheels, which stays the same height off the ground. And that, this Isuzu has a mechanical arm here, sort of spring-loaded, that is attached to the axle, and then it's got a valve here. And this valve controls the distribution of brake fluid when, when you're pressing on the brakes. 
And what it basically does is that when you're fully loaded, it opens fully, allowing a 50% of brake fluid or brake pressure or brakiness, as I like to call it, to go to the back and 50% to the front. So when you have a heavy load and you hit the brakes, the back doesn't want to really swing around, causing you to have an accident. And likewise, when the vehicle is now offloaded, your load bin lifts up and it controls this valve, which sort of splits a 60-40 in favoring the front. So you get 60% of your brakiness in the front and 40% in the back. Again, so your vehicle's less inclined to lock up on the back because now you're offloaded and you have less weight on your back wheels. So remember, braking is all about how much pressure you are putting on the brakes and how much on that particular wheel or axle and how much um, traction that particular back wheel has or front wheel or whichever wheel at that particular moment in time because it's always about that particular moment in time because your braking is dynamic and and this leaves us with this very simple mechanism which is it's straightforward it's basically a hydraulic valve and this brings us to to this particular video which is the bypassing of your low tensor valve now it's important and, and and i think the most important thing to take from this video is that vehicle manufacturers are, are there's a lot of competition in between the companies and and one of the major factors driving the sales of the vehicle is the, is the cost of production of that vehicle so there's a school of thought that says, you know, if if a washer in a particular place is not 100% needed, they don't use it because they have to keep their costs as low as possible. So whenever you're working on a vehicle, it's important to remember that whatever was there is there for a very good reason, because if it didn't need to be there, it isn't going to be there. So whatever you're doing, try to keep it as original as what happened when it came off that production line because of vehicle costs so it's it's a school of thought that says right you know the manufacturers have put this this low tensor valve in for a very good reason so whatever happens if something goes wrong with it it's best to replace it so that's the first school of thought and that is always that should be in the front of your mind whenever doing any vehicle repairs or restoration if it's there, it was meant to be there. The other school of thought is this is a mechanical valve and it's a 40 year old mechanical valve and it contains O-rings and all sorts of moving parts and those can fail. Now I have had a load sensor valve fail on me before on a Ford Bantam and what happens is all the fluid runs out and you have zero braking. So first off, you've got this 60-40, 50-50 split between the braking, which is really, really not a hell of a lot because it's a very old vehicle. It's not a very fast vehicle. And quite frankly, if you're under load, you shouldn't be speeding anyway. That's the way I see it. And if you are not under load and you hit the brakes and the back wheels lock up a bit, your weight is anyway moved to the front. And so you have more traction, more brakiness on the front wheels where you need it and your car will stop as long as you can drive. And, and so this is why I have come to the decision that this, now with the load bin off, it's probably wise to remove this brake sensor, your load sensor valve. Because these parts fail, as I say, I have had it happen before, and trust me, it's way more cat catastrophic to have zero brakes than to have your back wheels lock up a bit. If it is under load, you still have full brake pressure on the back and and you're going to be pretty safe so today's video is not about replacing this load sensor valve which I worked on the Ford Bantam was about 4,000 Rand to replace it or you can get a kit for 350 Rand but those kits always fail after some time and again when they fail they leave fluid everywhere and you have zero brakes so the decision was made after some thought to just remove the load sensor valve and bypass the brakes. So as we said, your brake line comes in and it passes through this valve and then it comes out and heads off down to 
your brakes. This is a bit more simple. It's one simple brake line that goes down that we need to bypass, not like the Bantam, which has dual ones, and that can lead to just more costs and having more brake lines made up. So the first thing to consider when you are doing a, a load sensor valve bypass, and this is going to seem like a very, very small thing to consider, but let's have a look at what's happening here. And the one thing that's what's happening here, let's move around a bit, is your brake line comes in. In fact, let's point the camera there while we are doing that. Your brake line comes in at the bottom here, comes out, and then it changes into a rubber hose here. And that rubber hose goes down to the axle because your axle is moving all the time. And uh, so it needs to be rubber, not steel. So this sounds like a silly thing, but it's also a mistake I've made before. Is you need to make sure your rubber hose is going to be long enough. Not only when you're bypassing the brakes, but also on an older vehicle like this, is we need to have the, the leaf springs reconditioned. And what's going to happen when we recondition the leaf springs is... Um, the vehicle is actually going to sit a bit higher. So this thing is going to be like that instead of with enough flex on it. So this could be too short. So before you do anything, take these things into consideration. Is your rubber hose long enough? Do you have to have another one made up? Are you going to recondition the leaf springs? Are you going to add another leaf spring in just to give it a bit more? You, you can take more weight, but you don't really want to overload it because the brakes and everything are not up to scratch. But it's a lot safer that way. So... Really look at that and look at what you need to do in the future. The other thing is, quite simply put, is that now when this bucky has got the load bin off, this is going to be a hell of an easier job to do without the load bin on because I've done this job with the load bin on and it's, it's tremendously difficult to get in there and start working on it, especially when you consider that this bracket needs to be moved up there, so we need to weld it on. And uh, now you're working with a petrol tank there, underneath the vehicle, up in there, it's just going to be very difficult. You're probably going to make a mess of it. You, you're not going to get successful welds. You're not going to clean everything properly, and you're not going to waterproof everything properly afterwards. And, and so this is why I've decided that this is the time. So before we get to it, just an interesting thing with um, your Japanese vehicles. When you're working on a Japanese vehicle, you're actually going to find that you're not going to get a 13 millimeter nut and bolt anywhere on this vehicle. Be it a bike, be it a pickup, be it a car, anything Japanese is not going to have a 13 mil bolt. And that's purely because of the superstition of the number 13. So bear that in mind when you set to it, because you're going to get your 13. You're going to look at that and go, oh, that's a 13. So is that and so is that. That's what I need. And you're just going to end up stripping nuts and bolts on a 40-year-old vehicle. It's not going to be fun. The other thing to bear in mind, um, nope, there's actually nothing else to bear in mind. So I'm going to get out my favorite weapon of choice. It's a 3 8 socket. I found the little quarter inch drive is too small for this job and the three quarter inch drive is just too big so this is just a lot more of an easier to use size. So without further ado I think we should get cracking and whip this off and see what we can do with the brake lines. So a few things here to remember when you guys are, are starting off on doing your own repairs. Here you can see this is off now. And you can see how that action works. We're going to take this off in as least destructible, destructive way as possible because, like I said, to, to find another one of these 
is going to be pretty much impossible. So because this is working, we could probably end up selling it somewhere to someone who has a leaky valve. But what we do have to check is inside this rubber that it's not leaking because it's got a rubber boot on here. Um, your brake fluid is most likely going to leak inside there. And this is why I say this is the dangers of having one of these on an older vehicle, is that you don't see it before it's too late. It's going to be dripping and filling up inside here. It's going to fail and you're only going to realize this when you're pressing on the brakes and you have no brakes because it's all leaking into this boot. Um, and that's why for me, in my opinion, it's safer to remove. So what I have done, just to make this thing come off easier, is I've cracked all the nuts so they're a bit loose and will come off easily. And for the new guys or beginners or guys who are starting out and just doing their own repairs, it's the way to crack a nut. If you have a nut that's very, very hard to get off, Never ever put your spanner on and give it a sharp impact with your hand, with a hammer, with a mallet or anything. Because the chances are it's not going to remove that nut, it's going to strip it. What you need to do is preferably get a ring spanner on there and start off with a slight and give it a sudden, not sudden, but a, an even pressure on until you hear that. So that's what you want to do is just get it and that way you'll find you're going to be stripping a lot less nuts because it is that exactly stripping a nut that makes a one hour job turn into a three day nightmare so let's continue oh the one last thing before you do this put a piece of plastic down because brake fluid is very very corrosive any paint or anything underneath if you get it on your skin it's best to clean it straight away afterwards Brake fluid is very corrosive and very, very dangerous. Um, it's actually often used as a paint stripper. It's also used for removing a stubborn nut. Put some brake fluid on, leave it overnight, and you'll find that that takes it off quite easily. Um, so yeah, let's carry on. Then we have our load sensor valve off. Let's see if we can see it from here. This is quite interesting because it has an adjustment here. And it seems like that adjustment, as that can move up and down, is to set it correctly on the point it's supposed to be. So we've done quite right here in removing this bracket completely. So we haven't destroyed this or altered it in any way and just like that it's ready to either go off to its new home or sit on a shelf somewhere for the next 10 years and I've got a feeling it's going to be sitting on a shelf somewhere for the next 10 years and that is our load sensor valve in a nutshell we do want to keep this in a plastic packet to prevent any dirt from getting or grime getting in there because that that never does brakes any good at all. And there is a nut somewhere. The nut has gone for a walk. There you are, Mr. Nut. That's it. Lovely. So our next step in the game is to now decide what we are going to do here. Because that needs to go into there. So there's two ways to do this. We can either bend that so it gets into there, or we can bring that to there at a point where it's going to be the most comfortable. And looking at this, I have a feeling that it might have to be a combination of the two. So if we cut that off there, <coughs> put it in position, and then while that tab onto there, then we'll be golden. And because we are going to be doing this job with a welder, 
there's no way of getting around that one. Um, it's easier to do it without a petrol tank right here. There's quite a bit of brake fluid come out there, so just as well we put our plastic down. And let's start marrying this up. Alright guys, so for the last bit of the video, we're actually not going to do it in time lapse. We're going to do it in video. There's a couple of things I want to talk you through here. Um, first off, we've had to bend the, the, the steel brake tube coming in. Um, because the angle is going to be a little bit different. We do want an angle down. But guys, please, for heaven's sake, if you're going to be bending your brake lines, please, wherever as much as possible, use one of these. It's a fuel and uh, brake line bender. I haven't used it on this because you've managed to get even pressure over everything. But it's so easy to get this thing into a kink. And once it's kinked, it's game over. Because the first thing you're going to do is try and bend it back. And you've got metal fatigue on the corners and it's going to crack. And it's going to just, uh, for the record, don't wipe your nose when you are, have got hands full of brake fluid. Um, anyway, back to that. When... When you bend it back, you're now going to get metal fatigue, you're going to get le leaks in the brake line, and you're actually just going to have to replace this entire brake line, which is going to cost you a little bit more than one of these benders, which you can get from wherever you are, North Harbour Freight, or whatever it is in your country, and they're not very expensive, and, and it's nothing compared to the costs of having to replace a brake line. So what we've not had to use that, so we'll just chuck it back there with the rest of the crap. The nice thing about a YouTube video is you don't have to sit and watch the bits where you would get everything together and get a new disc on the grinder and blah blah blah. We don't want our ratchet lying in brake fluid. So I've, if you noticed earlier, I popped this little bit in just to keep it uh, out of the brake fluid. Now this is a bit tricky because I want to keep this hose on for this, but I. I actually can't because I'm going to cut with a grinder here and it's going to fill it up with bits of steel which you do not want in your slave cylinders. So we'll pop off the little clip. That's it. And this is why we want to keep this bracket because to get that hole is not easy at all. So here we have our rubber hose and I'm going to put that in to minimize the chances of any dust or metal shavings or anything getting in there. And looking at this, I'm going to take that off there and pop it on there. So. stands for most important bit. And trim it a bit. Great. So now we can line them up. I've had to bend it down. Tell me if you can't see here. And that pops in there. As you can see, it has a little keyway in there to stop it from twisting. We don't really need a clip for this, but I think we might need it. Hmm. Not sure if we can't find it. 
I am going to use it. It's like all other steel clips. There's a tendency to pop off and disappear forever. There we have it. We just leave it in position. Now we screw this on. You see, it's so easy to cross a thread. This has got a knurled little bit and that pulls it on and that's aluminium. And that allows it to seal, but we, we don't want any lateral press or axial pressure on, on this at all. We want it to go in dead straight. So when we do that, we are set. And that is our angle. There's no pressure on the line. It's going to go in nice and neat. And we have a bit of a gap there, which is why I've chosen to use the MIG welder for this particular exercise. It's great at filling up gaps. And on this particular application, we're not going to use a TIG as much as I love a TIG welder. The MIG is just better at filling up gaps. It's got a bottom bit. And that bottom bit we want on there also. But again, we don't want too much of an angle. It's got to be just right. It will in fact go in like that. So we mark the spot with our finger in grease because that's the best marker in the world. going to do it. We have a lot of play in the line, so we're good. And let's zap it up. Now with a MIG, whenever I'm using that, you'll often find I only use a glove on the left hand. And this is because that can let you hold your part whilst you have a good feel with your right hand. Um, the left hand will let you hold it in position where you want it and you don't know, burn yourself but it can also be used to shield the wind because this is gas coming through here and that's what it's about so we're just going to tack it nothing more than that because we're going to have some flames coming through as you can see, and we don't want those flames. We want our 10 volt spanner. To affect this rubber hose. So we're gonna take the whole thing out the way and close it up, or weld it up. little keyway at the back is to prevent that from turning when you're tightening this up. That's its job in life. Good enough for me. Alright, let's go for it. Let's fold it up. As you can see, this job would be pretty much impossible to... Not impossible, nothing's impossible, but... It's a hell of a mission to do with your load bin on, which is why we are doing it now. Let's go for it. So on the welding side of things, we are not using argon gas. I have Tyrol gas, which I run. It's a CO2 gas, which I'm running on the MIG. Um, and the argon gas I keep specifically for the TIG. Your argon gas um, has a lot of cooling properties, which is why it's needed for the TIG, because the cooling properties are actually what uh, keeps your tungsten protected. But because it has cooling properties, you have less penetration. So I have a smaller argon cylinder, which would have been easier to carry out here. The problem is that because it's cooling, you don't have as much penetration. I'm set to 80 amps, which is more than about right for this. And uh, I want decent penetration because we don't want this thing to come off and start flapping around. Um, 
and to keep the old school guys happy we're wrapping the corners so yeah let's see if we can get underneath um, I think I'm gonna have to get out nah we'll come right let's do this I have a pair of welding glasses for this so your hood doesn't get caught on everything while you're trying to get in tight spaces but we're doing a video so no time to get them Right, as a saying has to be said, that is not going anywhere. So, let's finish it off, let it cool down. It's always better to let it cool down naturally. Um, if you're in a pinch, chuck a bit of water on, but that's, that's changing the properties of the metal, and we don't want that. We just want it to let, cool it down a little bit naturally, and then we'll waterproof it a bit and connect it up and then we need to be the brakes so on to the last bit right having coated that with uh, what's called bucky and trailer coating really quite nice stuff to work with it is waterproof it's quite robust and um, that's what they use for buckies as we call them and uh, and it's it, it's quite cheap so it's not like having the entire chassis rubberized and uh, stuff I've been using for years there's also stuff called stone chip which is a, a little bit more but um, yeah that, that's that's sort of what I, I prefer working with purely from a cost perspective but anyway so we're going to connect this up now the way we're going to do this is to make sure that's snug and then get that on and we are just going to get it in finger tight as you can see there's a lot of movement on there so we're not twisting it in any way if we do have to twist it we can do it which is why we don't put the clip in just yet um, but you want it to go in nice and easy. If, if you're struggling with this, you cross the thread or, or, or there's too much axial movement and, and, and you're actually just going to have a problem. Um, so we're right snug up. We can see the thread has gone all the way in that it's supposed to. And for our last step, second last, third last step, we're going to whack that in and we have it on. It's a very long thread, so it's going to be quite difficult to to strip. But you want it nice and snug. Remember, at all times, even pressure, not sudden jerking movement. You're just going to make your job a little a lot more difficult once you've damaged that nut. And there you have it. Our brake line is in. Comes straight past the bar part or the bar past the load sensor valve and down to the axles. Now all we have to do is uh, get the brakes bled, get some new fluid in, clean up and um, job done. Move on to the next bit. Again, please like and subscribe. Thank you.